to be together, isn't it? We are in our summer series, Summer in the Psalms, and so we're going to walk through or continue that series today. Last week, Seth gave us an introduction to the uh, book of Psalms, right? He uh, gave us the 30,000-foot overview. There's five different sections in the book. There is an introduction, Psalm 1 and 2, and then there's a conclusion, Psalm 150. And today we get the joy and the pleasure of diving into Psalm 1 together. And as we do, let's just close our, our eyes, bow our heads in prayer. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you have spoken and that you have revealed yourself to us in Jesus. God, I ask that this morning, um, Lord, would we humble ourselves before your word, before your law, before your teaching and your commands and your precepts, God. Would you speak to us afresh and anew? We welcome you here, Lord. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So we know that the book of Psalms is, is, a, is a compilation. It's a, it's a book that was put together with the purpose of uh, teaching people, teaching God's children the lifelong practice of prayer and of worship as they seek to follow his instruction and his guidance. And Psalm 1 specifically gives us two ways. There's two paths. It lays out two different options in life, two different directions. It's very clear. It's very black and white. It's very either or. There's no gray areas. There's no ditches. And I like that. I like black and white. Now, we acknowledge in life that there's nuance and that there's a little more gray maybe than I would like. But this psalm is focused on the very foundational issue, the root of the matter. When you boil everything down, you get to these two different paths. And these paths have very different outcomes, as we will see. Psalm 1, 1 through 6. I will read it as we jump in. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This isn't unlike other passages in the Bible. We see in uh, the New Testament, Jesus himself teaches that there's different ways, there's different roads, there's two gates, there's two uh, paths that one can take. One is wide and one is narrow. He talks about uh, two different foundations that you can build your life upon. There is the rock and there is sand. There's two choices, two paths, two directions with different outcomes. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Just a few verses later in verse 27, 24 through 27, Jesus says, Everyone that hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a foolish man who's... Oh, excuse me. Whoa, whoa. Let's read that again. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Two paths, two foundations, two roads, two gates, two very different results. Two very different outcomes. With one, there is strength, there is stability, there is endurance, there is life, there is abundance, there's blessing. And with the other, there is destruction. Or as the psalmist says, like chaff blown away in the wind. 
Sure, there's nuance and progression and gray area, but this morning we see the source matters. The source matters. Psalm 1, we're just going to walk through uh, verse by verse, concept by concept, and see what God wants to speak to your heart this morning as we dive in. Blessed is the man who, verse 1, this idea of being blessed is the idea of, of fulfillment, of satisfaction, this idea of being content or whole. There's a happiness Involved. The root word is, is a progression, is an advancement, is, is on a, a, a going, going straight, is being right with God. This is the man who is as he ought to be. This is the man who is complete and who is whole and who is satisfied as he ought to be. Because God is the source of blessing. God is the source of blessedness. God is blessed. And all who find themselves in God, the result of being in that blessedness is that you will be blessed. So the source matters. You could say, oh, how very, very happy is the one. Because there's a completeness and a satisfaction that goes along with being as you ought to be with God. Charles Spurgeon points out that the man is rather generic. It's an invitation, you see, for anyone. Anyone can be found in God, if that is the response of his heart. Spurgeon says, it is not blessed is the king, blessed is the scholar, blessed is the right, but blessed is the man. The blessedness is attainable by the poor, the forgotten, the obscure, just as it is by those whose names figure in history and are trumpeted by fame. Blessed is the man who. What follows is not a positive description, but the psalmist starts with a negative description. He describes what the life of the blessed man does not look like. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And we see somewhat of a progression here, right? First one is walking about, and he's taking in input and counsel and advice, and, and then one stands, and there's a plantedness, there's a groundedness, and then there's a sense of belonging when he sits and he kicks back. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The wicked are those who have turned themselves against God's law. The wicked are those who have no godly restraint or godly morals. The wicked are those that are criminals, those that are guilty. Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Where do you get your counsel? Where do you seek advice? Where do you begin to reason and make decisions? Counsel is that which we turn to for influence. For what we then do. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. What we think about, what we take in, matters. The counsel that we receive, the counsel that we seek, influences our point of view, our own ideas, and our own thoughts. Brian Tracy says, You are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. You are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. What we think matters. Where we get our counsel matters. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners. Standing in the way of sinners isn't to get in their way in opposition of what they're doing. Standing in the way of sinners is to be found in their shoes, to become like them, to act and behave like they behave. A sinner is one who is missing the mark. The mark is the law of and the teaching of God. And sinners are those who have chosen to go astray from that. Their heart isn't in line with the law of God. Their heart has gone astray. 
And if we let in the counsel of and the advice of and the reasoning of the wicked, we're going to begin to behave like and behave as and to do the same things that sinners do. Clark says, others have also seen in this progression of sin. The great lesson to be learned from the whole is that sin is progressive. One evil propensity or act leads to another. He who acts by bad counsel may soon do evil deeds. And he who abandons himself to evil deeds may end his life in total apostasy from God. Blessed is the man who does not behave in the same manner as sinners behave. Blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of scoffers. You see, we've gone from counsel and advice and mere thinking, well, it's only a thought, it's only an idea, to a behavior. Now we're in belonging. D.A. Carson describes it as getting in your lazy boy. Now you're one of the boys. You're one of the guys. You're part of the team. You belong to them. You laugh at what they laugh at. You joke about what they joke about. There's a sense of connectedness. Because you're mocking the same thing. Because you're laughing about and you're scorning and you're arrogantly pointing out the error in the same thing. According to your own reasoning and counsel that's influenced by the wicked. The scornful love to sit and they love to criticize the people of God and the things of God. They criticize and they mock at and they make fun of and they put down the things of God and the lives of those who are seeking to follow God in holiness and in righteousness. They mock orthodox understanding of scripture. They mock and they, they scoff at and they laugh at the ideas of purity and of righteousness and the notion that God's word is truth. They mock and they scorn. Perhaps you have found yourself being mocked or scorned. Or perhaps you have found yourself seated at the table mocking the things of God in order to fit in. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. And the psalmist gives us a warning. Woe to those men. Woe to the wicked. Woe to the sinners. Woe to the one that are on this path of the ungodly. To those who choose to live a life astray from, apart from, away from the teaching and the law of God. To those who have chosen to live lives marked by indifference, perhaps. Well, we have better things to do with our time than to study the old book. Or that are marked by uh, the idea of substituting your own thoughts and your own emotions and your own feelings for the teaching of God. Woe to those who, who listen and hear. You listen on Sunday mornings. You hear the words of God. You've heard the instruction and the teaching, but then you forget or neglect to do it. Spurgeon also says, we must remember that the lure of the wicked and sinners and scoffers does not usually appear in its grossest form. It may come in rather bump-along fashion. I like that phrase. I'm going to start using that. Bump-along fashion from teachers or friends or family or spouses. It simply suggests that if you don't think like this, you will not be thought sharp. If you don't act this way, you will not be cool. If you don't laugh at what we mock, we won't have any part of you. It's interesting that the psalmist points out that yes, the wicked will vanish and perish like chaff in verse 4. But in verse 6, it says also that the way of the wicked will perish. You see, there's an emptiness to it. It lacks substance. It lacks reality. It is, it is like a, a footprint in the sand on the beach. That it will vanish. The way of the wicked will perish. But now the psalmist goes on to describe... 
what the blessed man is found in, what his source is. Now, if you were a good uh, Hebrew scholar, which I am not, but I read them, you would know that in Hebrew poetry, the contrast is something that, that is meant to stand out. So you contrast light and darkness, you contrast good and evil, you contrast. So as you were reading this, you would expect a direct contrast. So instead of uh, uh, the way of the blessed man is not, uh, he doesn't walk in the, he doesn't walk in the, uh, well, counsel of the wicked. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners, right? He does not sit in the seat of scoffers. You would expect a contrast where the blessed man, what does he do? Well, he walks in the counsel of the godly. Well, what does the blessed man do? Well, he, he walks in the, uh, the way of the righteous. Or he sits in the seat of those whose mouths are filled with praise and thanksgiving. Right? That's what we would expect to follow, but there's a more foundational reality that the psalmist highlights by not using the traditional contrast. So it stands out to us as we read it. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. There's something more foundational. There's something so uh, uh, central to the man's heart that is blessed. And that is the root issue. It's of singular importance. The blessed man's mind, his focus, his heart, his longing is in the law of God. And the emphasis here is on the object of his delight. And there's a recognition that that, that that object, the law, the teaching, the precepts of God, that there's something so valuable there. There's something so precious that my heart longs for it. The emphasis is on the value, the intrinsic value and splendor and wonder of the teachings of God. And the man whose heart recognizes the splendor of God's teaching and his ways is the heart that delights in that object. And the idea of delight is a longing, is a desire, it's good pleasure. I want this. David Guzik says, if a person delights in something, you don't have to beg them to do it or to like it. They will do it all by themselves. You can measure your delight for the Word of God by how much you hunger for it. The law of God here refers to the teaching, the instruction, the doctrine of of the Lord, the words of God. We see uh, plenty of places in the Psalms where God's law, where His teachings are, are held in such a high view. Their caste is being precious and pure and good and desirable. Psalm 19, 7 through 9 is one example. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. It's perfect, it's sure, it's right, and it brings rejoicing and reviving, and it makes the simple wise. It's just by nature to be desired, and by nature it has value because it is of God. Proverbs 3, 13 through 15 says, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding for the gain from her is better than the gain from silver and her profit better than gold for she is more precious than jewels and nothing you can desire compares with her the man who longs for and hungers for and thirsts for the man who sees God's teaching as as precious more precious than than jewels It's more valuable than gold and than silver. He's blessed. 
because he knows the he knows the riches and that's what his heart runs after and that becomes the source of his life the delight of his day that man is blessed he's happy he's content he's fulfilled and he's satisfied it's not as a result of of, of having 10 minutes of devotion in the morning and checking that off your list. It's not a reward for going after it. It's a reality of being in it. And on his law, he meditates day and night, turning it over, thinking about it. I've often heard that it's like a cow chewing cud. How many have heard that? I can't identify with that. I've never chewed my cud. Think about it this way, meditation. Um, guys, going into a, you're on a road trip and you're going into a, a gas station, you need directions, right? So you leave your wife in your car, you humble yourself, you go in and you ask the clerk for directions. And the clerk says, well, go back to the main road, turn left two miles down at the stoplight, go left again, it's on the right beside the tire shop. Well, what do you do immediately? You repeat that back to him. Back to the main road, left two miles, stoplight, left. It's on the right by the tire shop. He says yes. What do you do as you go out the door? You repeat it again to yourself. You're opening the door. You're like, Man, I can't forget this. This, I can't, I'm not going to ask for directions again. I got one chance here to get this right. Out to the main road, left two miles, left of the stoplight, on the right by the tire shop. As soon as you get in the car, what do you do? You look at your wife and say, okay, main road, left, two miles, left of the stoplight, on the right by the tire shop. That's meditating. Well, why are you doing that? Because you want to live it out. Because you're going somewhere and, and you want to follow those instructions. So you're thinking about it. You're repeating it. You're dwelling on it. You're you're repeating it to the guy that told you. You're, 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 you're turning it around in your heart and in your mind so that you can do it. That's meditating. I can identify with that more than cows chewing cud. So the, the, the man that is blessed is the man that has the teachings of God on his heart and on his mind. And he's, he's thinking about it and he's repeating it. And he, he's telling his wife, hey, help me do this. I, I want to live it out. I want this to be the way I live. Well, why? Because there's value in it, because it's true, because it's right, because it's more precious to me than silver or gold. Right? That's meditating. And the man that lives that way will be blessed, he'll be happy, he'll be satisfied, he'll be content because he's in truth. And there's substance and there's life and there's... Blessed is that man. The kings of Israel were instructed, Deuteronomy, I gotta catch my breath. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, the kings of Israel was instructed that when he took the throne of his kingdom, what was one of the first acts that he was supposed to do? He said, he shall write for himself a copy of this law that was approved by the Levitical priests. He had to handwrite a copy of the law. Why? So that he would know what was in it, so that he could do it. You getting the idea? When Moses was uh, no longer with the children of Israel, God gave this instruction to Joshua. Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. The righteous man will only have God's word on his mind two times a day, church. It's day and night. That about covers it all. It's David Guzik. Now, the psalmist goes on to paint a picture of, for those of you that are visual, he paints a picture for you of what this looks like. He said, hey, you guys know what a tree is. 
this man. He's like a tree. And he's planted by streams of water. And the tree yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And I love this reality or this idea of this tree being planted because it's not a seed being put in the ground. It's a tree that's transplanted from one source to another source. And that new source is a source of life and vitality. That new source is streams of water. There's no dry season and wet season. It's streams of water. There's abundance for its roots. Well, what happens to this tree? Well, it's got, it's got good source. It has good water. So it's an evergreen. Its leaf does not wither. And it bears fruit, right? Its strength, its vitality, its endurance, its productivity. That is the life of the man that is sourced in God's word and hungers for it and longs for it because his source is good. The blessed man is like this tree. His source is life-giving and satisfying and strengthening, and he's producing fruit. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. So the psalmist reminds us that this is not the way the wicked live. The wicked do not delight in the law of the Lord. The wicked do not meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. The wicked are not like a tree. You can't really come up with something less like a tree than chaff, can you? Tree is strong, deep roots, fruit bearing, life giving. Chaff is, is, is a little crusty thing on the outside of a piece of grain. I don't know how else to describe chaff. And they would throw the grain up in the air and they would beat it with a stick or a tennis racket. It's probably not a tennis racket. They'd hit it with something. And the chaff would kind of fall loose from the, from the grain, and it would just in the wind. It's like, it just vanishes. It's gone. There's no value in it. It isn't remembered. No one talks about it except to say that's not what you want to be. No one applauds your chaffness in life. It's empty. Spurgeon describes chaff as intrinsically worthless, dead, unserviceable, without substance, and easily carried away. Easily carried away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. There's no strength for them to stand in the judgment. Daniel says, you shall be weighed in the balances and found wanting. You lack, you lack life. You lack substance. You're just chaff. Verse 6 says, The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked will perish. I don't think anyone reads Psalm 1 and says, I want to be chaff. Like, that's not how we're built or wired. We want to be the tree, don't we? We want to have fulfillment and satisfaction. We want our lives to mean something. We want to have strength and endurance, and we want to produce good fruit. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord Church and who meditates on it day and night. There's two paths. What path are you on this morning? Do you delight in God's word? Do you, do you delight in God's presence? Do you delight in his teaching and his commandments and his laws and his precepts? Or have you turned your back on God's morals and his ideas? And have you, have you decided that you have better things to do in your life? You have places to go. You have things you want to do and things that you want to accomplish. 
Maybe you're substituting your own feelings or your own desires or your own emotions. You're substituting those things for the truth of God's word and his law. Would you examine your heart this morning? Examine your heart. What path are you on? There's two paths, church. There's the wide path. There's the narrow path. There's two foundations. There's rock. There's sand. There's two, there's two ways. There's the way of the righteous man. And there's the way of the wicked. When you boil down everything else in your life, and when you get away, when you just get rid of all the peripheral stuff, and just go to the core desire of your heart. Do you desire the things of God? Do you see at the root of your heart, do you see the value of and the priceless nature of and the, the worth of Jesus? Would you run after him? Would he consume your mind and your heart and, and would he be your passion? Would he be your passion? What makes you happy? What gets you excited? Because this is a really good way to see what is important to you. David Guzik. If personal pleasure is the only thing that makes you happy, then you're selfish. Self-centered. If being with your family or friends delights you, that can be better, but it still falls short. The righteous man finds his delight in the law of Would you run after Jesus? Would you pursue him? Would you ask God to give you a fresh revelation of who he is? So that you can, that you can catch, a, uh, catch a, a vision of, of his wonder and his value, that it's something that's worth giving your life to rest in. So Psalm 1 and 2, we have an introduction to the book as a whole. Psalm 1 begins with this phrase, blessed is the man. I think it paints a picture for us of who Jesus is. Yes, it's our calling. Yes, we're called to be the man. But church, get this. Jesus lived it out perfectly. Jesus is a tree of life. Jesus is the source. Jesus is the way of the righteous. It's Jesus. So Psalm 1 paints this picture for us of the man. Psalm 2 ends the introduction to the book of Psalms and it says, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Praise God. Because if I look back over the last 72 hours of my life, I haven't walked it out perfectly. but praise God that I can take refuge in Jesus, that I can find my life wrapped up in him, that I can hide myself in him, that I can follow him, that I can allow him to teach me how to live it out moment by moment, day by day, because church, he's done it. He's done it. And his invitation to you this morning is, would you just get inside of me? Would you get inside of me? Would you let me help you make God's law the delight of your heart? Would you let me help you see the value of his teaching and of his word? Would you let me help you walk it out in obedience so that it's not something you just hear about on Sunday, but it becomes something you do on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday? Would you take refuge in him? Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Fulfilled, satisfied, content, happy. Because that is how man was meant to be. Jesus is the tree. Jesus is the man. Jesus is the way. And he has made a way for us to be with God as we were meant to be. Praise God. We're gonna take communion this morning. Worship team can come forward.
those serving communion can uh, begin your process of handing out the elements. Just want to recognize and remember this morning what Jesus has done for us. How he has made a way for us to be one with the Father again. We're celebrating that today. We're remembering that this morning. That though we were still sinners, that though we were helpless, that though we were missing the mark, that though our lives were sourced in something other than God, that though we were enemies, rebels, though we had turned our back on the, the law of God, Jesus has invited us back into that relationship with him and become the way for us. So as we reflect on Jesus this morning and as we prepare our hearts to receive the elements, uh, they're going to pass them out. Grimont's uh, open communion. If you believe in Jesus, we invite you to take this morning. Parents will let you decide about, uh, about your children. But as we reflect on who he is, I'd like us to, to recite the Apostles' Creed together as we, as we focus our hearts and our minds on what we believe. Titus, could you put that up on the screen for us? So let's just say this together, church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and he was born of the Virgin Mary. I believe he suffered under Pilate, was crucified, and he died, and they lay him in the tomb. He descended to the land of the dead, and the third day he rose again. I believe he sits at the right hand of God. I believe he will come again. I believe to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Church. I believe in the body of believers. And when the cross Jesus died, our sins were set aside, and because he is our Lord, we'll live forevermore. Amen. Church, Jesus has done something remarkable for us. Do you believe that this morning? Even though our words are a little funny on the screen, we can still believe it. We can still celebrate it. We can still rejoice in it. And today we proclaim together the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And these elements that we have represent his body that he broke, that he gave for us, and his blood that he spilled so that we could be purified and washed and made whole. In Luke 22, verses 19 through 20, Luke says that, that Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me take and eat the body of Christ in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this is the covenant in my blood which is poured out for you Church, would you take and drink the blood of the new covenant? We're just going to close our time together in praise. Allow God to search your heart. Have you taken refuge in Jesus? Do you delight in his word? Do you know him as the way? God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your blood. Thank you for the power of your life and your death and your resurrection. God, thank you that you are a tree of life and that you are beckoning us and calling us to hide ourselves in you. Oh, we love you, Jesus.